covering it. I'm doing double duty here. I'm I'm um, I got a new setup. I'm testing it out. And um, additionally, I wanted to respond. I, I, I've posted some shorts and had some responses to the shorts. And um, I had an interesting conversation with a guy going on. I'm not going to try to say <laughs> YouTube username. Um, yeah, I should not try to say this. But I'm, I'm going to call him E. I'm going to post a comment and leave it as a, this video as a, a comment, as a reply. Um, it was just very interesting. Uh, the conversation that we were having, and I, I wanted to res respond to some of the things that he brought up here. I, of course, we and we disagree with each other, but it's just such a it's it's a very nice conversation where we're just kind of um, explaining to each other where we come from. And he, of course, feels that um, Jesus fulfilled many of the prophecies. I feel that he didn't, and so I'm I'm going to jump ahead in his comment, and I'll post the whole comment on here. But um. He said, for the Messiah's reign here on earth, because I pointed out that Jesus wasn't king. He said, I think this would refer to Jesus' reign at the end of time over a new heaven and earth. Jesus himself said several times that the kingdom of God wouldn't be fully manifested in the world as we currently know it, but when God has fully reconciled the world to himself. Okay, fair enough. Um my point is that Jesus wasn't king, and this is part of the prophecy, which would make him an unlikely candidate to be the Messiah. Um, the The problem I have here is, yeah, okay, Jesus said it wouldn't be manifested until later, but we're we're talking about fulfilling prophecies, and the prophecies don't say, okay, so the the Messiah is going to come, and then he's going to die, and then he'll come back, and then he'll be king. He'll, you know, um, there. Are, things that Christians obviously read as as maybe hinting about a second coming or, or something like that. But, you know, I just, it's not there. It, it, it never explicitly says this. And I would liken this to somebody prophesying that, that my favorite football team is going to draft the greatest quarterback of all time and he's going to win the Super Bowl. And then that year, my team drafts, drafts like the top prospect, great quarterback. And, and he comes and he does amazing things for the team, but we never win the Super Bowl. And then he retires and you say, well, you know, maybe he's going to like come out of retirement and lead us to a Super Bowl or so. I, maybe. But I think we would have to at least concede that this part of the prophecy wasn't fulfilled. And that, that's the point that I'm making. Um, a lot of times Christians will say, oh, Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies. Well, he, he didn't. Like in the Christian view, they'll say, well, he's going to fulfill it. Like he hasn't done it yet. They wouldn't say he hasn't done it. They would say he hasn't done it yet. But from a skeptic's view, there's no difference between hasn't done it yet and hasn't done it. <laughs> you know, same thing. He hasn't done it. And here you're 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 talking about a couple thousand years. I, I don't think it's an insignificant thing to point out that Jesus wasn't king, and he he seemed to indicate that his return would be in the lifetime of the people who are around him, and it didn't happen. So now I'm going to go back to the beginning of the comment and address the other things that uh, are in here that I'd like to get to. He said, "I'd like to ask, doesn't maternal maternal lineage count in Israel? Honestly, I'm not too familiar with Jewish culture. Uh, let me pull this up." In the book of Numbers, um, if you go to chapter 1, I know I had it counted. I think it's 14 times in chapter 1 and, and of course, the first verse of chapter 2. I think it's a total of 14 times that it, it, it commands them to count by the house and tribe of the father. Okay, not the mother, the father. And this is significant when we get to the daughters of Zelophehad, specifically the second occurrence in Numbers 36. Now, earlier in the chapter... Um, these, these girls are, they're the daughters of Zelophehad and he died without leaving a son. This is when they're wandering in the wilderness and they're worried about getting land. Um, you know, they want to carry on their father's name and they, they want land. They want an inheritance, but they don't have a brother. If, if, if Zelophehad had a son, he would have inherited land, but land doesn't go to the daughters. It goes to the sons. So Moses commands them to give land to the daughters. And now what happens is, um, let me actually back up to the beginning. Beginning of chapter 36, the heads of the father's houses of the clan of the people of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, from the clans of the people of Joseph came near and spoke before Moses and before the chiefs, the heads of the father's house and the house of the people. So these are the people of the tribe of Zelophehad. Remember, the land is allotted by tribe. And then inside of the tribal allotment, each family gets their allotment. They said, 
Um, the Lord, I'm just going to say Jehovah for the sake of this video. Jehovah commanded my Lord to give the land for inheritance by lot to the people of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by Jehovah to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, to his daughters. So Zelophehad, what he, you know, he died, but it's given to his daughters. But, say the leaders of, of this tribe, if they are married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the people of Israel, then their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of our fathers, so from the tribal inheritance, and added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. Uh, what tribe did they say it was in again? Manasseh. So if, if these women married somebody from the tribe of Judah, what they're saying is that this they have a son from the tribe of Judah. He's from the tribe of Judah. He's going to inherit the land. And then they go on to say, so it will be taken away from the lot of our inheritance. And when the jubilee of the people of Israel comes, this is when the family returns back to any land that's sold returns back to the tribe. And when the jubilee of the people of Israel comes, then their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry, and their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. So the people of the tribe of Manasseh are saying, we'll lose this land to Judah or whatever tribe they marry into, right? In other words, the sons, the inheritance is going to go to the tribe. The sons will be of the tribe of their father, not their mother. So the land will then pass from our tribal hand into that tribe's hand. Goes on, verse 5, And Moses commanded the people of Israel according to the word of, of Jehovah, saying, The tribe of the people of Joseph is right. This is, what, this is what Jehovah commands concerning the daughters of Zelophehad. Let them marry who they think is best. Only they shall marry within the clan of the tribe of their father. So they can only marry inside the tribe of Manasseh if they want to keep the land. It says the inheritance of the people of Israel shall not be transferred one, from one tribe to another for every one of the people of Israel shall hold on to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. I want to say this again because this is important. This is number 36 verse 7. The inheritance of the people of Israel shall not be transferred from one tribe to another for every one of the people of Israel shall hold on to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. If Jesus does not have a human father, then he does not have a tribal affiliation. His mother being Jewish, he's Jewish. He's just not a member of a tribe. He cannot be the member of, a, of his mother's tribe. And this is like, this to me is a huge passage on this, right? It goes on to say in verse 8, And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the people of Israel shall be wife to one of the clan of the tribe of her father, so that every one of the people of Israel may possess the inheritance of his fathers, so no inheritance shall be transferred from one tribe to another. For each of the tribes of the people of Israel shall hold on to his own inheritance. So the inheritance can only go from the father to the son. It, even here, where the daughters are given the father's inheritance, it cannot be transferred out to the son of a man from another tribe. It has to stay in that tribe. If Jesus does not have a human father, then he does not have a father of the tribe of Judah. He cannot receive the inheritance that was promised for David to pass down to his sons in the tribe of Judah if Jesus is not a member of the tribe of Judah. Because, like it just says here, you cannot transfer the, the inheritance from one tribe to another, for each of the tribes of the people of Israel shall hold its own inheritance. And then again, back up to verse 7, the inheritance of the people of Israel shall not be transferred from one tribe to another, for every one of the people of Israel shall hold on to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. If Jesus doesn't have a father, then he doesn't have a tribe. You know, I mean, this, this is a big problem in my opinion. He goes on to ask, and is an adoption valid in Israel? could be. Um, but again, adoption, does that change who your father is? Um, it seems to me that you could adopt somebody, absolutely. But can you then um, pass on the land to that person? I wouldn't think you could. I, you would have to produce a scripture that says you can, is, is what I'm saying, rather than just speculating. And also, did Jesus see, if, if we go with the adoption thing, how does that work? If Joseph adopts Jesus, is he no longer the son of God and he's now the son of Joseph? You understand? Like, you lose a lot in that transaction, I'm just saying. 
Um, he goes on to say, I think Jesus has implemented world peace and brought people to a knowledge of God through Christianity. I would argue that if not for the global spread of Christianity, which was quite, ex quite extraordinary in my opinion, and it was, very few people would actually know about Jehovah. Also, the moral teachings of Christianity are amongst the purest you could find, if not the purest, and Christian bodies have been at the forefront of a lot of charity work going on in the world. So I think that Jesus has fulfilled that criteria. Um, how are you defining world peace? Implemented world peace and brought people to a knowledge of God through Christianity. I mean, wars and rumors of wars, right? I mean, it's not, I, I don't know how you would define that as world peace. I mean, are Christians moral people? Most of the ones I know are very moral people, very charitable people. I don't, I don't dispute any of that. It's just, that's, that's not what the prophecy says, you know, that he will come and set up a religion that will lead people into a more moral life. I mean, great. I'm glad, I'm glad it does. I'm glad it works, but um, that's not what the prophecies say. I'm skipping the part I read earlier and going on to the end, but how would you address Isaiah's prophecies, which seem to point to Jesus suffering and death for the remission of sins? And do you think that Jesus would have worked so many miracles, including his eventual resurrection, if his message wasn't approved by God? Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to have to jump around here. Let's go to the book of John. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe in, in the resurrection, obviously. And I, I think that um, you basically, if you are a Christian, you believe in the resurrection. And if you're not, you don't. <laughs> like, I, I, would, I would presume it's that simple. Um, my thing is that in, 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 in John chapter 19, um, there's a slightly different account of the burial of Jesus. Um, I'm trying to find the verse here. Let's see. Jesus side is pierced. Jesus is buried. Here we go. Um, the other gospels all say this is Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. He had just cut it out. It's like a brand new tomb. But in, in John chapter uh, 19, starting in verse 38, it says, After those things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So it seems to be a, a temporary burial, right? Um, the, no one had been, you know, the tomb was open. It was close by. It was about to be sunset. It's about to be a uh, Shabbat day of preparation. We can't do it uh, after that. So we're going to bury him there and move him later. And this seems consistent to me with what Mary says when she doesn't find the body. Next chapter, verse 2, uh, she says, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. So it seems like she's there to prepare the body for a reburial. And she goes, they've already moved the body. I don't know where they put it so that I can... Um, prepare the body, you know. Uh, that, to me, is the most likely explanation for the resurrection. Jesus was temporarily buried in a tomb because it was nearby. He had to be moved out of that tomb later. So you do actually have an empty tomb, but it's not because you have a resurrection where the physical body walks out. And I would even point you to, matter of fact, let's go to Matthew. Um, and by the way, interesting thing, read Matthew and John's account of the resurrection. Just Read one and then the other. Okay, It'll blow you away. They're not even close. Um, but one of the things I want to point out in Matthew's account, um, according to Matthew, Matthew is the only one, when the women get to the tomb, the stone is still there. Um, let's see, what chapter are we in? We're in 27. Um, Jesus is buried, the guard at the tomb. Okay, we're in chapter 28. And it says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Notice what happens here. They get there, the stone's still there. The stone gets rolled away. Where's Jesus? The angel says, come in and see that. They, they don't see Jesus walk out of the tomb. Why not? 
It says, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there, there they will see me. So in in John's account, when Mary gets to the disciples, she says, Hey, they, they took away the body. I don't know where they laid it. Here... An angel has already informed them of the resurrection, and they've personally met Jesus on their way to tell the disciples. You know, I, it, it's listen. I get it. If you if you, if you accept the story on faith, I get it. It's it's so contradictory, though. Like, how would a skeptic? How would a skeptic reconcile these things? Right? In one, the stone's already rolled away, and the other, it's still there. And this one, you know, they they know every detail of what's going on. And in John, they, you know, she's like, hey, uh, they moved the body. We don't know where they put it. Um, it's just very problematic. Let me go back because there was something else in that comment I wanted to address. Yeah, okay. So how would you address Isaiah's prophecies which seem to point to Jesus' suffering and death for the remissions of sin? Uh, you're talking about Isaiah 52 and 53. Who's the servant, you know? Um, repeatedly in the, if, if you start in chapter, I think it's 42, Report there's about 10 times where the servant is identified as Israel. Um, I read it as a servant is Israel, and I don't read it as dying for your sins. Let me, um, let's see, Isaiah 53. Let's hit that real quick. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see it as saying he's actually dying for your sins. I think, I mean, that, that is one way it can be read. But if we go to Isaiah 53, um, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of Hashem been revealed? Um, who's talking here? Well, if you back up, back up one verse into into fifty two fifteen. So he shall sprinkle many nations; kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told to them, they see; and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what they have heard from us? So this seems to be the kings of the nations talking. And to whom has the arm of Hashem been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Like this to me is talking about the nation of Israel, right? Now it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God in a Afflicted. Is that true when the when the Christian church was persecuting the Jews? Did they believe they were doing the will of God, right? We we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted? Yeah, that's true. Um, Paul says that it's the evil powers of this world that crucified Jesus, and God had to hide the plan from them or they wouldn't have known. So Paul didn't certainly didn't see Jesus as smitten by God. Um, that's a later Christian with the um, what do they call it? Anyway, where he's he's dying a substitutionary substi uh anyway, he's being punished for your sins. That's a, that's a later view, that wasn't an early view. Goes on in verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. Um again, he was pierced for our transgressions. I wonder what the Hebrew uh is I mean it's obviously a prefix here, but I'm just curious. Let's look up and see what the word is here. Um, let's see, it's popping up on the other side. But yeah, he, he was pierced for, could it be by our transgressions, crushed by our iniquities, right? Um, in other words, the I, I believe this is a king kings of the world saying, we did iniquity when we pierced and crushed the Jewish people, when we thought we were doing what God, we thought he was smitten by God. We thought we were doing what God wanted us to do. But as it turns out, we were transgressing by what we did to Israel. Um, and with his wounds, we are healed because through this, the Messiah comes. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. And, and again, laid on us the iniquity of us all. Well, what do you mean? Is that Jesus taking your sins on the cross? I mean, how would you prove that, right? That, that is what Christians believe, to be fair. But how would you approve, uh, how would you prove to somebody that Jesus had all the iniquities of the world on his back. And if he did, shouldn't we all then, aren't all our sins paid for, whether we accept it or not? Um, if he literally died for the iniquity of us all. But what if, and Hashem has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What is saying here, like, 
These are the kings, saying, Our iniquity landed on them. Um, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, he opened out his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before his shears, shears is silent. So he opened out his mouth. I think the funny thing with that is that you get these accounts in, in I think it's in Mark, where Jesus is completely silent, you know. Um, but it, it, it doesn't, you know, in other gospels, he actually does respond to the charges against him. And it seems more like they're trying to bend history to fit this chapter to say that it's Jesus. Um, they made his grave with the wicked and the rich man in his death, although he did no violence. Here, here, you know, let me jump up here real quick, because I think this actually, there's a better way to approach this. Let's do this. Let's go to, um, the, it'd be in the end of Luke. Remember the road to Emmaus, right? This is where Isaiah 53 first shows up in the New Testament. Now, I, I, again, you might get references to it earlier. I don't know. But you can see what happens with Isaiah 53. Let's go to, um, yeah, Luke 24. On the road to Emmaus, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they're walking. Jesus shows up, right? And uh, they don't realize it's him. So when they get to the, you know, as they're walking, Jesus, you know, they don't know it's him. And they say, um, he says to them, what is this conversation? This is verse 17. He said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cl Clopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. Right? Now, if Isaiah 53 is talking about a Messiah who's going to come and die for your sins, this should have confirmed their hope. They should have said, hey, we were pretty sure this was a guy, and now that he died for our sins, it turns out he has to be the guy, right? But they don't. Instead, they go the opposite way. Why? Because nobody would have read Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus before the church developed a theology based around Isaiah 53. But it just wasn't the view of people prior to that. I mean, this is over and over in the New Testament where Jesus is encountered, you know, and asked by a multitude in the book of John. And they say, you know, he, he calls himself the son of man, but wouldn't he be the Messiah? The Messiah, he can't be the Messiah because the Messiah can't die. So who's the, who's the son of man? And, and people are just confused by the things he's saying because none of them have a view of the Messiah dying. This is perfectly clear. Um, the Ethiopian eunuch, right? He comes up, uh, Philip comes up to him, like, do you understand what you're reading? No, I don't. I need a teacher. Philip goes, hey, this is talking about the Messiah. Oh, okay, now I get it. Like, nobody was teaching this. This this is a development of the church that comes after the death of Jesus, in my opinion, to explain how the Messiah could have died, you know? Well, if we read Isaiah 53 just right, it'll get you there. And I guess it will. It's an effective way. Most people... They, they they read it and they go, well, this has to be talking about Jesus. But it just, during the life of Jesus, nobody actually took it that way. Anyhow, I hope this answers your questions. It is helping me test out my new setup here. So <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity either way. And thank you for watching my videos and for the good conversation we've been having here, my friend E. And anybody else who enjoys this video, subscribe to the channel so you can catch more of them. Thank you.